Okay. Um, so welcome everyone. Um, okay, welcome everyone uh, to our Sussex Development Lecture. Um, my name is Matthias Ramirez. I am a senior lecturer at the Science Policy Research Unit of the University of Sussex. And I'm really delighted to welcome Professor Joe Chatterway to our Sussex Development Lecture talk today. So the topic is um, policy pull or science push, which uh, I think is very interesting uh, take, play of words on the old debate within science and technology studies of the 90s around technology push or technology pull, which then gave way to a lot of work on, on systems of innovation. So I'm really looking forward to this. I just want to introduce Joe very briefly. Um, Joe, of course, was professor at SPRU, where I got to meet her. Um, and now she, she works at University College London, which is where I did my degree, um, at the Science, Technology, Engineering and Public Policy Department, which is STEEP which is in the Faculty of Engineering at UCL. So Joe heads the department there. Um, but I also want to mention that she is the principal investigator of a very important ESRC project uh, where they set up the International Public Policy Observatory, um, which mobilizes and assesses evidence to inform policymakers in the UK um, about the best ways to mitigate social harms associated to COVID-19. Now in a minute I will put the link to that if you're interested in, in, in finding out about what they do at the IPPO, but it's obviously a very very important area and it, and it tells us obviously that Joe talks a lot to policymakers, um, which is a particular area of work um, I, th I would think across the global north and the global south, that's certainly my experience. So I'll pass you over now to Joe. Joe, please. Thank you very much. And the floor is yours. Oh, thank you, Matthias. And thank you uh, for the introduction. I'm going to share my screen and hopefully my slides will appear. There we go. Can you see the slides? Yeah, I can see. Them. Great. Good. Um, uh, it's really uh, lovely to be uh, virtually with you uh, today. And thank you very much to the organisers for asking me uh, to give this talk. Of course, it's a very strange day. And um, if uh, many of you are checking your news feeds as you listen to this uh, lecture, I think I would be doing the same. Um, uh, but I hope I, I hope I can interest you in, in this topic of, of policy pull or, or science push and how we best build bridges in, in challenging times um, between evidence and, and policy. So this talk is, is indeed about the supply of and demand for knowledge in relation to policy. It isn't directly about international development, but the topic matters, as Matthias said, for, for international development, as, as for many other areas where the aim of much of the research done is to uh, inform and, and influence policy. Uh, um, towards the end of the talk, I will talk uh, a little about some patterns of global spending on, on research and what this means. Um, uh, for lower middle income countries and the quest for developing mechanisms to bridge across evidence and policy in those national contexts. So uh, the instinct uh, uh, in, in answer to this question, I think for most of us would be both. Um, we certainly need uh, the science and the evidence and we need uh, demand from policymakers to make uh, that bridging uh, between evidence and policy uh, come alive and uh, and, uh, and and be a reality. Um, and as Matthias mentioned, uh, it's actually really interesting the parallels to innovation systems thinking here. So with respect to, to innovation, 
innovation systems literature taught, taught us and teaches us such a great deal about how supply and demand uh, for uh, technology uh, work in order to de deliver and create innovation and how different parts of an innovation system uh, need to be integrated to achieve innovation goals. And in a sense, I think that is exactly uh, what we are trying to do with respect to evidence and policy now, looking at how the pieces uh, of, of a very complex uh, jigsaw puzzle, if you like, need to be brought together. As we do that, I think we need to recognize um, that our terminology uh, is, is quite uh, vague as we seek to, to look at what works, works best in, in, in this area. So we use the term broker, broker brokerage and engagement uh, to cover a very wide space uh, in ways that, that perhaps aren't necessarily helpful. So I'm gonna look at that term uh, broker and the, and, and the terminology uh, in the talk um, and we'll ground some of my concerns about um, the, uh, the, the very broad umbrella terms that we use. I'm gonna ground uh, my, some of my concerns about all that with respect to um, the, uh, the International Public Policy Observatory that Matthias mentioned and that I co-lead. Before I do anything else, I want to think a bit about the context and about why uh, this issue of bridging evidence uh, to policy is so much in the spotlight at the moment, why it's highlighted as, as being important right now. So uh, during the pandemic, uh, there was a lot of talk uh, about um, uh, the role that science and evidence was playing, uh, a lot of emphasis put on uh, evidence uh, informing policy. We're led by the science and uh, all of those all of those phrases that we've heard endlessly over the last couple of years. Um, so in a sense, you know, it was it was research and evidence coming to the rescue in multiple ways beyond uh, the creation of a vaccine. There was an idea that policy was. Uh, was was being uh, led by the evidence and led by the science. But actually, uh, if you take a step back from that, um, there seems to be a really patchy performance uh, amongst countries with the best research institutions and policy-based responses. So if you think about the UK, we are blessed with very strong research institutions, and yet beyond health uh, and perhaps very narrow areas of, of behavioral science, the extent to which research has informed um, uh, policy has been quite limited. And of course, there are many reasons for that, but it draws my attention to our learning and lack thereof uh, about how to do engagement, how to broker, how to integrate across subsystems of, of, of research to provide science advice. So um, uh, it, it indicates for me that it's important that we try and improve our learning about what works and what doesn't, otherwise we'll miss the mark as, as the graphic in this slide conveys. Of course, before COVID, there was a growing concern uh, uh, to have more impact with the research that, uh, that is funded. Uh, and implicitly, impact often means impact on, on policy. Jonathan Grant and others have documented how in, in the REF submissions in the UK, for example, the biggest category of impact is in relation to policy. Catherine Oliver, Paul Kearney, and a great many others have documented uh, a growth over the last four decades in initiatives which seek uh, engagement to facilitate uh, the use of, of evidence in, in policy. And of course, uh, as, in, as in other ways, the field of international uh, development has been a front runner, um, and particularly institutions like IDS and, and SPRU, funders like IDRC have begun to build up knowledge uh, infrastructures to facilitate uh, that engagement between research and policy. And all of that is well in, in advance of, of COVID-19. I mentioned before briefly the, the work of Catherine Oliver. Um, based on a systematic review, Ka Catherine Oliver and colleagues note that the vast majority of engagement activities between uh, evidence and policy aren't evaluated. There's uh, very little reflection on 
on them um, and uh, not nearly enough uh, in the way of, of trying to learn what works and what doesn't in that engagement. Because of this, they call this explosion of work in engagement and brokering in the engagement and brokering space a rudderless mass of activity, which is a, a very powerful uh, phrase and one which sticks with me. Um, everyone wants to say they're engaging, uh, but we don't know much about, about what works best. And Catherine and, colleague, Catherine and colleagues in response to this situation have set up an initiative called Transforming Evidence to try and uh, rectify this. Uh, James Wilsden um, heads up uh, an initiative uh, called Re the Research on Research Institute. So things are beginning to change. There's beginning to be an awareness that we need to uh, figure out what's going on and, and, and what's not going on in a more systematic way. But, but there's lots to do and, and there's a long way to go. And I think we're still lacking in, in conceptual tools and data infrastructure to enable that learning. We do know that this approach on the one hand and on the other hand uh, uh, doesn't work too well in most instances. So, you know, uh, it, here we have on the one hand research funders and research activities, and on the other hand, we have a need for expertise and, and evidence. And in the gap in between, we have uh, in-person briefings, dissemination, policy briefs, post-research engagement. Sometimes it works, sometimes it works more probably in the areas of life, life science and, and physical sciences where once in a while you have a very clear-cut result that has an immediate implication, for example, uh, on regulation. And you find a ready policy audience and, and, and this works. But, but in most cases, uh, the emerging evidence is that this kind of gap-filling um, uh, uh, approach doesn't, uh, doesn't really yield uh, success in, in many cases. What we uh, begin to see more is a kind of uh, a, a whole world building up around uh, policy for science and, and under policy for science comes, for example, uh, the allocation of research funding, regulation of, of, of research, knowledge exchange activities, and science for policy, um, science advice, knowledge synthesis, uh, uh, networks um, to inform uh, policymakers and and uh, this uh, graphic, which um, was suggested to me by by a colleague of mine, Sarah Cornell, uh, depicts kind of busy bees uh, creating uh, a world uh, to to uh, bring these two spheres uh, together, and we begin to see that 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 world being created. Um, and it's much more than filling the gaps, obviously, with uh, with uh, discrete bits of, of research and it's 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 emerging as an important field in itself and it requires its own infrastructure norms and, and institutions so over the last uh, few decades we've seen uh, some of those initiatives organ organizations infrastructure um, aimed at a, a assembling communicating and and integrating knowledge emerge for example the IPPC or the IPBES um, uh, Gavi, uh, the public-private uh, partnerships in global health could also be considered from this angle, uh, and there are many other initiatives at, at many other kind of national levels. In the UK, we have the Areas of Research Interest um, initiative, which works back from uh, what government departments think they need in terms of research to, to the researchers who could synthesise knowledge and, and, and deliver answers to, to questions. The University uh, Policy Engagement Network, UPenn, has been established, and also the Capabilities in Academic Policy Engagement, CAPE, and of course many other uh, initiatives and research projects which are, are trying to uh, create an infrastructure around these two worlds to bring them together. I'm um, going to talk a bit about IPO, as I said I would at the beginning. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you why I'm going to talk about it, which is when the pandemic hit, uh, we saw funders begin to, uh, to sponsor initiatives that are much uh, more explicitly demand led, that are working back from what policymakers need to try and provide knowledge synthesis. Um, and in the case of IPO, uh, our, um, our, our remit was to try and address uh, a wide range of harms that are associated with the pandemic, uh, to try and uh, synthesize knowledge to address those harms. So these initiatives, IPO and, and other initiatives, 
are not primary research based, uh, they're based on knowledge synthesis. So the US and Canada uh, have both launched uh, knowledge synthesis uh, initiatives uh, to try and bring social science in particular interdisciplinary research to address the harms, harms associated with the pandemic. Uh, and, and in the UK, the ESRC uh, funded the International Public Policy Observatory, and I'm PI, and I co-lead that with David Goff, Jeff Mulgan, and Aidan Wilson. Uh, sorry. Uh, so what and who, who is, I've said a little bit about uh, what IPO is, it's a partnership and it's funded by the ESRC as a strategic initiative um, to respond to, to, to policy need with rigorous international and national knowledge synthesis. And its mission, uh, it's a very grand mission, uh, and we're a two-year grant uh, in the first instance, to mitigate serious uh, social harms of COVID-19 and accelerate the UK's uh, recovery from the pandemic. Uh, I will just mention very briefly who we are. So at UCL, it's steep science, technology, engineering, and public policy department I lead, and the Epicenter, which is a, a, a center devoted to systematic reviews, rapid evidence reviews, and other forms of knowledge synthesis. We um, were absolutely committed to not having IPO be a, a Westminster-led trickle-down uh, initiative. So we have very strong partners in, in uh, Northern Ireland, in Wales, and in Scotland. Uh, we're partnered with the International Network for Government Science Advice, and uh, the COVID tracker outfit at the Blavatnik School of Government. So um, we, uh, uh, with those partners, can work to provide pictures of how policy emerges uh, globally. Um, and in the case of, of INCSA, the, the uh, Government for Science Advice Network, we can begin to look at uh, how policies get implemented um, and how evidence uh, informs those, those policies. We are also partnered with The Conversation, uh, right from the very outset, this uh, being a, um, a, a knowledge synthesis uh, and evidence to policy uh, initiative, uh, we knew that communications would be absolutely vital. Um, and so uh, we are working with the conversation as part of uh, what we do. I'm not going to dwell on uh, on what we do actually too much at all. I want to get because the point of this talk is how we do it uh, more than what we do. Um, uh, so I won't uh, I won't go into the aims. I've talked about those a bit, um, uh, but but important to say you know we're we're, we're trying to help make better decisions by providing evidence in conditions of stress. Um, uh, uh, what we do is is on the right hand. Um, side of the slide, uh, we have all sorts of uh, knowledge synthesis uh, uh, and expert uh, blogs up on the website. If you're interested, do go take a look. Do, do go take a look. Um, we have uh, systematic reviews and rapid evidence reviews uh, in the works to uh, uh, at the moment on fields such as uh, basic income, uh, social capital, population level, mental health. Um, we were very keen to have lived experience um, uh, as part of the kind of knowledge base that we're working with. And so uh, there, there's that on, on the website too, and, and very much part of the kind of round tables and meetings that we run. I will just mention the living map of evidence. So that is a map that's available to anyone. It's up on the website. And what it does is um, across the areas that IPO is working in, in the very broad areas, um, education, mental health, uh, adult social care, uh, housing communities, uh, cohesion, um, and, and several other areas. The living map of evidence uh, lets you look uh, at, at uh, this at systematic review evidence in relation to those, uh, th those areas. Um, and as I said, it's it's open to anyone. You can just go in, and you can you can you can uh, you can target if you, your search. So if you're interested in younger populations or older populations, or you know, list of other ways in which you might re refine your search, that 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 you can do with the living map of evidence. I won't say more about what you know what it is we do, but as I said, uh, if you're interested, do go to the uh, do do go to the website. It's um, uh, full of stuff. What I want to talk about is how we do it, um, and I'll say more about this. So this is the model of knowledge brokering. We use the language of knowledge brokering and still still do. Um, and this is a fairly conventional model, I think, uh, which we um, 
uh, developed at the beginning of IPO's existence to kind of guide our work. And the idea here is that because we're demand led, we start from uh, policy need, uh, we start work with lots of stakeholder engagement, um, national governments, devolved administrations, charities uh, and businesses and so on um, to define the areas uh, that we're going to work in and to define the research questions. And then the idea, you know, you go away and you do uh, lots of work constructing these, these um, evidence products, the evidence reviews, uh, the living map, the, the systematic reviews uh, and the scans and then you go back to the policymakers uh, who helped you define the questions and who want the and need the evidence and uh, and and you uh, work to connect um, uh, uh, supply to action with them um, uh, on the basis of what you've done and of course disseminate uh, to the world more broadly. What we found though when we began uh, work is that this wasn't what we were doing quite. Um, what we were doing looked more like that. Um, uh, so a messier, uh, double helix kind of structure. And the basic difference uh, between that first model and this model is that there is constant iteration. There is constant iteration uh, between the evidence and uh, policy communities all the way through. So rather than having a kind of stage uh, uh, approach, which, which uh, that first model kind of conveyed, uh, it's, it's very much the case that we are uh, working on the basis of, uh, of constant uh, uh, conversation and iteration. For example, you know, we, uh, we, we realized pretty quickly that if you go into a room of policy stakeholders and say, so what is it you need, uh, you, 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 you don't get far um, and you have to do quite a bit of work before you get to a round table where uh, those research questions are, are, are more defined in surveying the landscape, who else is uh, working in the area, what's been done in the area, what's what kind of uh, policy already exists? Um, uh, what 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 are sort of what's the codified and tacit knowledge um, that we're working with, and and then even when you're 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 engaged in 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 knowledge synthesis, um, we uh, we have found it very useful to have expert uh, committees, policy uh, stakeholder committees. Um, uh, and, and made up of those with lived experience too, uh, meeting at, at, at while that that uh, knowledge synthesis is going on. And the point here is not that you can necessarily, um, uh, you know, chop and change while while you're in the process of doing a systematic review. Quite difficult uh, to to do that, but you have to know how the policy landscape is changing, uh, so that you can uh, adapt. Um, uh, the questions that you're working with to the need uh, as the need evolves. And the same thing at the end of the work, you need a, a lot of engagement uh, to work with policymakers who are uh, stretched uh, to, to, to the limit, who have very little absorptive capacity. You have to wake, work hard um, to, uh, to, 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 to explore the ways in which the evidence that you've gathered um, uh, is uh, the many types of evidence that you've gathered that uh, might relate to what they're doing. So that's the model we've we've kind of used to guide the work. Um, when I was uh, talking to uh, to uh, Sarah, who suggested that diagram uh, to me uh, earlier today, she said, "Well, it sounds at points like like it's a tug of war, and and it does feel like that at a point. Sometimes it does. It's it's not easy to uh, resolve the relationship, but." Uh, but, but there's no option but to, uh, if you want to have impact, I think, but to, to struggle with the tensions as you go along. So in a sense, I think uh, that helix conceptualization of what we do fits very well with a sort of post-normal characterization of science and science policy. We've seen uh, throughout the pandemic of the pitfalls of relying on, on single disciplinary models, epidemiological models in particular, uh, for example. And so we know we need to integrate uh, across uh, and, and draw from different disciplines, different knowledge communities uh, in the analysis uh, that we do and, and um, and also to integrate across policy silos. And we need to do that all at some speed uh, because of course uh, in, in the pandemic and in many other uh, policy arenas, uh, things move fast. 
The complexity of the relationship between evidence and values is highlighted, and I'm going to say more about that in a minute. And of course, we can see a profoundly non-linear relationship between science and policy, uh, which that double helix diagram depicts. So I think with IPO, um, it feels to me uh, that we've gone beyond brokerage. We don't broker evidence in, in, in conventional ways. We build relationships, we co-produce, we shape agendas, uh, often across policy and, and evidence silos. And in opening up evidence-based conversations, we pull together things in, in very distinctive and incomplete ways. And I'm gonna say more about that in a minute. And always with reference to what others are doing in the space and what others are doing in the space does influence what we do in the space, getting a picture of that landscape uh, of what others uh, are doing is, is quite important. And we do all this very quickly. So um, uh, I'm, I, I think the term uh, broker is, uh, is, is, is perhaps not, not a good description, not the best description of everything that we do. And um, uh, I'm uh, gonna talk now a little bit about a, a paper that Peter Gluckman, um, and his colleagues wrote in 2021 around this notion of, of brokers and brokerage. And this, uh, th 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 it's, a, it's a, I think, a very helpful article. Um, and one of the points that, that Peter Gluckman and colleagues make is that, 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 that brokerage is not simply a passive uh, translate. It's not a passive thing. Uh, the broker isn't a passive translator between two distinctive cultures of, of policy and science. As I indicated earlier, that there's a lot going on that's much more active in building the linkages in, in bridging uh, uh, success, you know, in trying to bridge successfully um, the worlds of science and, and policy. So I think uh, that's absolutely right. Um, but, but on the other hand, you know, some brokers do limit themselves to offering evidence uh, in, in easily digestible packages for policymakers uh, and, and, and do it in a more passive um, uh, way, while others uh, go well beyond uh, that notion of, of, um, uh, of a passive broker. Some brokers are active assemblers of knowledge, they're conveners, they're capacity builders. David Lewis uh, and colleagues from the LSE um, note in a recent study, which is going to be published shortly, uh, uh, based on case studies uh, in high income and low and middle income countries, um, the multiple roles that are played by those uh, in the broker domain, from convening, co-production, tailoring outputs and training, it goes well beyond passive gap filling. But the fact is, there are many kinds of knowledge, there are many kinds of knowledge synthesis many kinds of policy demands and uh, many different kinds of policy actors. Jeff Mulgan has a piece on the EPO, IPO website about differentiation, differentiating between different kinds of, of synthesis and knowledge. And I think we need to build uh, frameworks to help us better understand and further differentiate between these multiple kinds of, of brokerage and engagement activities. And that will really help, I think, in trying to evaluate and learn on the, uh, if we can do it on the basis of more finely honed questions about what works uh, in, in different contexts. Um, uh, so I think that stretching of the term break, brokering um, is not doing our, ourselves any favors and it uh, isn't necessarily helpful in getting us beyond the rudderless mass of activity uh, that uh, comes under the broad banner of, of engagement and brokering. So if I think about what describes us better as IPO, this term actually uh, uh, rings, rings as a more accurate description, integrator. Um, integration, this comes from a Harvard Business Review, obviously referred to, you know, used to refer to companies, but, but, but I, I think is, is useful in thinking about what we do at IPO. Integration is the achievement of unity of effort. The integrator's role involves handling the non-routine, the unprogrammed problems that arise uh, among uh, the traditional functions as each, each strives to do its own job. I think uh, there's a lot of that that, that rings true uh, about how we do stuff at IPO. So it's much more like uh, uh, the, the, the graphic on the right-hand side than delivering a neatly packaged uh, gift. 
uh, I think we're uh, much more in the business of trying to bring together lots of different colors, varieties, da da da, in order to hopefully mix them all up and come out and, and have a light bulb uh, moment. So, um, I said I, I would talk a bit more about the, the relationship between uh, values and, and evidence. And I think this is, a, this, is an important, this is an important thing for us to, to think about. Uh, again, I'm, I'm looking back to the Gluckman article and, and, and one thing um, uh, Peter Gluckman and colleagues do is, is to acknowledge that um, uh, it's important to recognize the ways in which values and evidence are intertwined. At, at different points in the process of bringing evidence to bear on policy decisions. Uh, they are deeply intertwined. And as I, you know, I think you can see from that double helix diagram, it's, it's, it's quite difficult to disentangle at, at any one point. I mean, obviously when you're doing the rapid uh, review work and systematic review, you have rigorous um, uh, principles to, to, to keep you on track, but, but in framing questions, in, uh, in, in defining which policy landscapes you're working with, much more difficult. So given that, I'm, I'm more skeptical about how possible it is, as, as Peter Gluckman and colleagues indicate, is necessary here to chart the value dimensions in, involved in a decision as being, is necessary. Um, he's making the point here that that is necessary, but the prioritization among these values isn't the role of the broker, should be left to the policymaker. Um, all, of, all of that, uh, I, I, uh, I don't have issue with. The point I have issue with is, is the ability to chart the value dimensions uh, in, involved in uh, all aspects of the, of, of the evidence work um, and the decisions which are based on it. Uh, I don't think uh, that that, as I said, is uh, necessarily congruent with the with the double helix model I I uh, outlined earlier. So I we certainly need to try and uh, create balance and and to check ourselves uh, and and we do that. We always uh, invite people to the roundtables and and to feed into our our. Um, efforts to define research questions, we invite people with different perspectives and from different kinds of policy communities. But if we tried honestly to keep track of the ways in which values and evidence and decisions inform each other, I think we'd be paralyzed. Um, uh, and, and one thing that we really want to do at IPO is to make sure that we have uh, knowledge coming from lived experience when we're in when in the room when we're trying to define research agendas and research questions um and uh, you know if you're if you're talking in this way about um uh separating out values from evidence uh, it misses the point with respect to uh to 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 that community uh, and that kind of of knowledge uh, that you're bringing into the room um, so I think we need to be pragmatic in, in what we do, and we need to deal with an incompleteness uh, in terms of, of evidence. And implicitly, you know, that incompleteness uh, does mean we're at risk uh, of valuing certain types of, of, of evidence researchers, policy stakeholders over others. And it doesn't mean that we're dishonest brokers, to go back to Roger Pilkey's fav famous uh, honest broker idea, um, uh, it doesn't mean we're stealth advocates, uh, again, referring to Pilkey or dishonest integrators, uh, but because the nature of how we work and, and, and partly to do with the speed of how we work, uh, it leaves us vulnerable to, to that incompleteness, which uh, could be, um, if you're wake, working on the basis that you can disentangle things fairly easy, easily can be misconstrued as, as, uh, as bias. I don't think it's... Um, uh, you know, it, it's obviously not a, a, um, a deliberate attempt to to uh, to introduce uh, bias or, or to 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 act, to act as a stealth advocate. So I just want to say I'm aware that there is a huge amount of social theory um, that's relevant to these issues, uh, and um, I'd, I'd be keen to talk about that more. But what I'm not going to talk about it in this talk. Um, we could come back to it in the discussion, perhaps, if people are interested in, in talking about that. But, but, but my issue here is less about the relative nature of truth and whether you're you take a social constructivist approach to that or a critical realist approach to that. 
Um, uh, but it's about the practicalities of, of trying to operationalize an implementation strategy for effective evidence and policy interaction based on the idea that you can simply assume that you can disentangle values and evidence in a straightforward way. Now, now you may think this is a kind of minor point, and, and, it, may, and it may be, um, but, but, uh, but, but for me, I, I, I've been thinking about this quite a lot. And, uh, and, and I think it is quite important in terms of the way we think more broadly about doing the research to, to, to policy work. Because I think um, uh, if we're working from the assumption that we can maintain uh, clear boundaries, um, uh, we, we don't necessarily uh, value some things which I think are really important. Um, so first to say, I think, you know, acknowledging that things may be incomplete, that that um, that that you won't necessarily be able to capture uh, in a rigorous way every perspective, every bit of evidence, every community that you need to, doesn't mean you can chuck out uh, uh, rigor in methods and approach. I think it's actually an argument for, for being more rigorous in, in methods and, and approach. But I do think uh, it means that we need to uh, uh, incorporate a diversity and a plurality of actors and approaches. We need to acknowledge uh, that that uh, that there will be uh, multiple ways of looking at questions, of asking questions, of answering questions, and we need to encourage that diversity and plurality of actors and different approaches. We need to be open, transparent, and and encourage the dialogue, and we need to operate with a degree of humility. So there's that famous dictum, all models are wrong, some are useful, and I think we could say all integration activity uh, is, is incomplete, um, uh, just wrong and incomplete in better and worse ways. And, Sorry, and, could you say that again? Oh, Sorry. that's my watch talking to me, <laughs> uh, which it does on occasion. Um, uh, so so you, can, you can do these things in, in better and worse ways, and I think, you know, having these kind of, uh, these principles, if you like, helps us to uh, do them in a in a better way. So I think uh, we need to we need to work on on um, with these principles to to find better ways of of classifying uh, what it is we mean by knowledge synthesis, the different types of knowledge synthesis, and we need to be able to cohere and assemble knowledge sets and understand on the basis of of, of better analytical character categories what we're doing what the uh what what what, what different uh, approaches mean and until until we do that i think we'll have difficulty getting beyond the rudderless mass of activity depicted by catherine oliver and colleagues i said i would come back at the end of uh the talk to thinking about um some patterns in global r d spending and um uh, the relationship between those patterns and what I've been saying. So I'm going to talk here very briefly about uh, this graph, which comes from a project called the Steering Research and Innovation for Global Goals project, it's led uh, by uh, by Spru, by Tommaso Chiali, um, uh, and and uh, the PI is Andy Sterling uh, from Spru, and. Um, uh, what uh, is immediately apparent from um, this uh, this graph is, uh, if you look at the uh, the note up on, on the right hand side of of the graph, um, ninety percent of SDG related research is done in high income and upper middle income uh, countries, done by researchers in those countries. Most research is unrelated to uh, uh, to SDGs uh, uh, and and at national level uh, social and economic goals associated with the SDGs. So um, those two things uh, make it quite difficult uh, with respect to um, the kind of work and how we do the kind of work that I've been talking about uh, to to. Uh, in, in low and middle income countries, um, because whether or not uh, you, uh, you you like that broad term brokerage and, and you think that more conventional brokerage appro approach should be the one we, we work to, or, um, or as I've suggested, acknowledging uh, the complicated nature of the iteration, uh, in both cases, you need, uh, you, you, you need nationally based um, 
uh, research capabilities and, and researchers uh, and, and brokers who can successfully navigate uh, national uh, terrains with respect to the evidence and policy. Um, and uh, what this uh, graph uh, indicates is, is that that's missing um, and that actually uh, the specialization uh, of, of uh, research um, is, uh, is, 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 is A, not working in, in a whole bunch of policy areas uh, very well. There isn't, there's very low levels of specialization um, with respect to a whole bunch of, of, of the SDGs, but also that uh, where the research is, is being done uh, in, in high income and upper middle income countries is, is an issue uh, too. Um, I could say much more about that graph, but I won't. I'll, I'll stop there and um, open up for uh, any questions you might have or any comments on what I've said. Um, I'm very interested to, to, to hear from you at this point. Okay, shall I stop sharing? Okay. Very good. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Joe. You're dealing with lots of really complex issues um and at the coalface i would say of of this this question about um policy policy makers and the interface with with science scientists and researchers uh it's an old chestnut but it's it's you know really developing the the debate around that is developing uh, very much so now um so that was really really interesting and it opens up a lot of you know questions Oops, for the audience then. Um, the way in which to ask questions is through the Q&A. You'll see at the bottom there um, that there's, there's, there's Q&A there. So I, I, um, if, if you could just, just write down your questions there. You could also perhaps use the, if you want, you can use the chat as well. Um, but, but anyway, one, one of the two. Um, there, is, there is a question there already, Joe. Um, but I'm just wondering, while before before I take the the questions from the audience, and while they're thinking about different questions that could come up, I could perhaps ask you one using my my chair's privilege, and um, it's got to do with um, the role of uh, whether it's an integrator or a broker or an intermediary. Um, whether it can act, it, in your opinion, it, it can or it should act as a change agent in, in situations and conditions in which um, change is seen as important, as necessary, and, uh, you know, it, it has to be put forward. And, and so take something like, you know, the most obvious is, is obviously sustainability and the need for change. And some actors, not all, but some are willing to do that. So that provides a space in which to do that. And um, that means perhaps um, raising new agendas. And, and then this balance between optimization and change, I think, comes up, which can be you know, quite, a, quite a difficult one to do. Mm. Um, so do you think that's possible? Uh, and since you're talking about how, <laughs> um, you know, what, 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 are, what are the ways in which that do you think can, can, could or can happen? Um, I mean, I, I, it's a really interesting question, Matthias. And um, I, uh, I think if we're doing uh, research on the basis that we want to have policy impact, we're almost, it's almost, inherently a change agenda that we're working to isn't it we we ha we we are hoping to change things on the basis of the research we've done now i um i know you work with with the transformative innovation policy consortium and um and that's a very interesting approach to explicitly uh using evidence and policy to uh, create transformative change 
Um, so I, I think, you know, that's one way to do it. You can set your stall out at the beginning. This is what we're aiming to do. Get on board. Uh, we'll figure it out uh, to, to, together. Um, or you can, uh, you, you know, there are plenty of other uh, ways in which uh, you do that. So um, the IPPC is, is a very different approach to doing that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, uh, the IPBS is, is yet another different approach to that. Uh, Gavi, uh, completely different. Uh, all working with the idea that you need research and information and evidence uh, uh, to inform policy, but but doing it in different ways and 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 doing it um, uh, with respect to that issue of values and evidence in particularly uh, is particularly important uh, in in thinking about the difference. Um, because uh, you know you have a you know with Tipsy there's no question. Uh, you, you have a specific uh, set of values which which you want to uh, you you want to introduce into the debate from the beginning about how to create change. Um, whereas uh, you know other other others are uh, are working on the basis that that it is um, for the decision makers for the policy makers. Uh, to use the evidence, um, uh, but, but uh, provision of that uh, evidence is where you're hoping uh, that the decisions they make will be uh, grounded in in good research and evidence. So, I mean, I think I think those differences are really important. I don't think it's a one package uh, a, a one package um, can fit every different type of uh, a, a broker and an engagement initiative and um, you know, part of what I hope to, to get across in this talk was that we need to get away from uh, an umbrella term and think more uh, creatively about how we categorize and understand uh, that, that, that whole spectrum of, of mm. different um, initiatives and the way they work uh, with, 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 with respect to engagement and that with respect to values and, and evidence. Mm. Thanks, thanks. I mean, I, I partly say this because of the difficulties that we also have going from word commitment to actually implement to, to changing uh, practices mm -hmm. of policymakers. It's actually very diff uh, difficult very uh, to do so. But OK, so we've got lots of questions coming in now. Um, so uh, shall we start with uh, Sarah, Sarah Quinnell? Um, what I'll do is I'll read this out and... Um, Joe, you can you can read it as well uh, for yourself. Why do you think of your answer? So, um, Joe, you have spoken about values. Uh, if we think about George Orwell's quote for a moment, all animals are equal, but some are more equal than others. It can be said that the, uh, in the type of work that we all do, that all voices are equal, that some are more equal than others. IPPO works uh, a bit like a select committee on steroids. So how have you uh, worked to consider positionally in the, fra in the framing of questions and the types of evidence uh, looked at? So, so yeah, you're not going to get away from these issues, Joe. No, <laughs> uh, no. And, uh, <laughs> well, in, in posing the, in framing the talk in the way I did, I, I was, uh, I, I, I certainly wasn't trying to shy away from them. Um, I, I think that, that, that the way you put that, Sarah, is very useful. I do think it's a matter of considering uh, our position, our positionality uh, with respect to um, both the evidence and the policy uh, landscapes. Do I think um, uh, voices are, uh, are equal, but, but some are more equal? I do. Uh, I think, uh, and that's part of the challenge that we're up against. Uh, that that the, if you're doing things at speed, it's 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 easier to listen to the voices that uh, are articulated very well, that are practiced, that have a a, a position in the landscape uh, that's well defined and well respected. And I think you know that's part of of, of the incompleteness that uh, that I think we we have to be aware of. Um, uh, and and you know, we have to do our best to overcome that to get to the voices that that aren't um, heard uh, 
as as often uh but we uh probably won't manage that in 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 a totally complete way um so uh i i think the the, the best we can do is to acknowledge that uh and 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 bring in uh other to be open, as I said, to be open and transparent and open to the dialogue um, on in a very ongoing uh, ongoing way. Um, I like the analogy of select committee on on steroids. Um, I guess, uh, yeah, we are the ones who are providing evidence uh, to a select committee in that analogy. And um, uh, uh, yeah, that, that 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 fits in in that respect. Okay. Um, uh, one from Carlos Andres Gallegos. Um, thanks so much. Very interesting resources. I am particularly interested in the section where you talk about values and science, which made mm. me think in the role of grassroots and civil society in a triangle with science and policy making. Uh, could you please comment about it and, if possible, provide a resource that addresses? that intersection which i'm sure you could do afterwards but but um yeah so it's it's you've got science you've got policy and perhaps if you add civil society perhaps what carlos yeah. is getting at is all the knowledge that exists within uh, civil society as well uh, yeah. which is phrased in a different way than perhaps science would traditionally do yeah. which is i think a very very relevant thinking about transdisciplinarity and so on mm. No, it's a really good point. And um, uh, if I think about IPO, you know, the, the way uh, we try to bring in those voices is, is in terms of uh, shaping the research questions um, uh, that we work on, uh, shaping um, the agendas uh, that we develop uh, around evidence and policy. We, we try hard to get um, charities and civil society actors uh, and, and grassroots actors uh, where that's relevant um, on board to help us do that. Um, uh, I, I think uh, that there is, in the work we do, uh, an, in, an inclination to, um, to draw on codified knowledge, we need to do that. Uh, so uh, that uh, by and large is, 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 is not uh, a, a, a modus operandi which um, includes uh, civil society. So in terms of the formal review work, the rapid evidence review work uh, and the systematic reviews that is more exclusionary of, of civil society um, uh, of civil society. But, I mean, if you're thinking about uh, the ways in which uh, policy uh, gets uh, developed and integrated and, and implemented in more holistic terms, civil society can obviously be a very important actor. So with respect to that kind of policy landscape and your understanding of, of the role in which civil society uh, plays, it's it's critically important to keep um, civil society actors uh, in in mind. Uh, you know, it's a it, it's it would be a, a misleading to think that policy uh, results only from government decisions. Policy results from all sorts of dynamics. Um, uh, uh, which you know includes a uh, dynamic brought in by by civil society organizations so with respect to working with different organizations working with different types of of policy stakeholders i think civil society uh, is absolutely critical and um i think there has been some good work done on the role of civil society in policy making um and i can i can try and dig some of that out uh, for you uh, if that's of, of interest. Yes, I think the whole work of David Hess on yeah. undone science would be relevant there, which would be, um, that's more of a sort of social movement type approach, which is one of the ways in which civil society expresses itself, of course. And there's others, there's RRI, Responsible Research and Innovation, um, lot, lots of other ways of thinking about that as well. Um, yeah. 
I, there are lots of ways of thinking about it. And it, it is interesting that um, in the UK, the ESRC and, and uh, UKRI have, it seems to me, developed very, um, they are experimenting with different ways of uh, influencing uh, policy. So for example, in the initiatives that they set up. So for example, if you, we have a sister observatory uh, called the Economics uh, Ob Observatory, which works much more uh, on the basis of direct contact with um, publics rather than us. We work uh, with policy audiences as our prim prim primary um, audience, but, but ECHO is working uh, to inform general publics and to engage with general publics as their point of departure. In, in trying to influence policy. If you think about the UK in, in, in a changing Europe, um, that initiative which was led by Anand Menon, I think that's the model which is much more about influencing uh, the press and the media as a route in uh, to developing policy. So I think this is, uh, I, I, I think it, you know, as part of our effort to develop a conceptual framework which differentiates between different approaches, different relationships with civil society, publics and, po and, and policy communities. I, th I think it's important to be able to describe those initiatives in more um, refined ways than simply brokering and, and engagement. Mm. Okay, should we, should we take another one? Um, so um, James um, Gorkalakis, um, fascinating Joe, can I ask how we reconcile epistemic advice and political realities and whether demand-led services like IPPO are always being pushed unhelpfully towards certain kinds of evidence. For example, systemic reviews. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, that's what we're pushed towards. <laughs> it's not what we only work with. Uh, so we, we're not only working on the basis of systematic and, and rapid evidence uh, reviews. Uh, if you look at the website, you'll see we have a whole variety of, um, uh, of, of those uh, uh, snapshots that I described um, of policy and, and evidence, the living map of, of evidence. And we also work hard to try and integrate uh, lived experience um, uh into into the work we do um do i think it's unhelpful that we're pushed towards systematic and rapid evidence reviews i'm not sure i i think it's unhelpful but i do think we have to uh, as i said acknowledge the limitations of of what it is we do as one initiative and and one way of working with different um, uh, knowledge synthesis uh, products. And we have to acknowledge that it's incomplete and, and that requires us to uh, engage, uh, to, to, be, to be open to dialogue and to bring in uh, other forms of knowledge uh, synthesis uh, to, the, to, to, to the landscape as, as best we can. So I'm not sure, I think it's un, unhelpful to be doing um, uh, the systematic reviews, the rapid evidence reviews, but we have to acknowledge it's partial. Mm. Hmm. Okay. Um, right. Um, so I want to ask you one that came up in the chat, actually, uh, rather than the Q&A um, from David. Um, so one of the things that I'd like to know more about is whether you and your colleagues think we also need to rethink how we um, think about whether how policymakers actually use or don't use evidence. Um, how far do we need to rethink our assumptions here? Yeah, it's, it's not neutral. Um, no, of course not. No, no. There, how, do we, uh, how do we choose it? Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's that's a really uh, interesting question. And of course, the, the policy makers and policy stakeholders aren't one thing either. Uh, they're a hugely diverse body of people. And there are, you know, uh, civil servants who fall within the category of, of, of policy makers as well as politicians. There are a huge race, range of policy stakeholders at different levels of government who have all sorts of, of, of influence on, on, on how policy gets made. Um, 
Yeah, so I think do we need to uh, to rethink our assumptions? I think if we're thinking that the assumption is that there's a straightforward kind of engagement uh, on the basis of uh, purely the evidence that you'd like people to look at, I think we do need to to reassess that. Um, and 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 uh, uh, there's been some really interesting writing on the politics of of policy making uh, and how that impacts. Uh, on on the way that evidence gets used and and gets uh, gets ignored, uh, which I think we we you know is 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 really obviously relevant and 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 interesting. Um, Paul Kenny uh, is one you know person that's done quite a lot of work on on that, um, but but others have too. Um, so I think there's that we do have to acknowledge that that it's a you know complicated mass of kind of uh, of of, uh, of stuff going on in 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 that relationship and that policymakers tend to use evidence uh, um, in a variety of ways and in a variety of ways that suits them um, so so it's uh, you know it's 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 a fundamental point the extent to which you you get involved in trying to uh, promote uh, the evidence that you have uh, with various policy community communities as, as, as opposed to others. I mean, I think that's, that's uh, you know, there, there are lots of uh, questions and issues about how we do that. Um, but uh, from a pragmatic perspective, that is, uh, that's often what, what, uh, what happens, that the policy communities who are most likely to take up your uh, your evidence are the ones you you focus on. Um, I suppose that's where the IPPC model is, is quite a good one because it's, yeah. it's it's not just one piece of evidence. It's it brings in everything, all the peer review work, you know. And then if you get a weight of evidence in one area, it's, it's difficult to ignore. Uh, I mean, that, I suppose that's the way they deal with that, isn't it? They 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 say, hang on a minute, this is a cross section of everything. And you can't just pick and choose what you like, uh, which is quite interesting. You know, yes, no, I think, you know, that that's the legitimacy of the evidence. Yeah. yeah, the legitimacy of the evidence is 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 uh, is you, you, that community works hard uh, to to uh, present the evidence in a way that it is difficult to ignore. I mean, I think those who are close to the IPPC uh, would have quite a bit to say about that and, and the ways in which um, the, the evidence gets framed uh, for certain policy communities and not, and not others. I, I don't think it's it's straightforward, but but you're right that uh, that's one way uh, to to try and deal with the issue that you uh, just create a kind of a huge infrastructure around the evidence that that makes it difficult uh, to, to to ignore. Um, yeah, so very interesting, uh, very interesting questions. I think another an, a, another um, issue here is uh, it, we have to understand the, the kind of the, the, the ways in which um, policy is made, particularly during uh, crisis and, and uh, you know, and, and the pandemic. Uh, people, pe people, lots of policy communities, lots of people working in government departments just had um, very, very limited absorbative capacity. They were uh, incredibly stretched and um, minimal amounts of, of time and, and effort to really engage with the evidence. And of course, you know, that, 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 that's very difficult when you're trying to get bodies of evidence in, in front of people. Um, it, 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 does, uh, it does absolutely mean that, uh, that, that you can't just hand things over, that you need to construct the conversations, you need to keep going with the conversations. It's, a, it's another reason that that kind of iteration uh, needs to happen the whole way through to try and overcome the limitations of, of, of that absorptive capacity. Um, and I think uh, along with that, that uh, low levels of absorptive capacity, you need to think about the ways uh, in which knowledge um, flows or doesn't flow across different policy silos. And that is very, uh, you know, that's a very limiting factor, actually, because 
a lot of the challenges require that to happen, mm -hmm. uh, require, uh, you know, not only integration of evidence, but integration at, at a policy level. How you facilitate that um, uh, is, is, there's a limit to what you can do as an outsider. Uh, but 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 uh, trying to construct the right conversations is 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 important, um, and trying to engage you know cross section of of of, of policymakers across different domains is mm. is really important. There's a limit to what you can do um, uh, as an outsider. I would imagine would be very relevant in something like COVID when it's about behaviour as well as you know psychology as well as social science uh, as as well as natural science. Sorry. Uh, yeah, definitely. At the, the level of evidence, you need to, um, you know, to address uh, uh, the fallout uh, from COVID uh, with respect to um, uh, to economic and social well-being. Of course, you're going to need to integrate a huge uh, uh, amount of evidence from across disciplinary silos. So, you know, if you think about um, uh, a question of, of mental health, uh, mental health uh, requires... Uh, a huge amount of, of evidence and policy engagement uh, from, um, from a range of different government departments and from, uh, you know, effectively to implement policy, you need, you need ideally engagement at different levels, local, regional, uh, 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 and, and that all needs to happen in, in the devolved nations also. So, so the, the effort of integration uh, is a huge one. And I think part of the challenge we have is that we, um, uh, you know, that, that the tools and the mechanisms and the infrastructure to integrate knowledge in the way we'd like to, and to integrate uh, in terms of, of what kind of um, policy engagement is needed is, is really, we're, we're at such an early stage of, of trying to develop uh, that sort of integrative infrastructure. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and, and I think over the next uh, few years, it'll be more apparent that we need to really devote much more time and effort to doing that. We need to devote time and effort to how we assemble knowledge, to how we you know, bring it together and how we try and bring policy communities to act on the knowledge uh, together. Okay, um, can we crack on with some more questions? Um, I'm gonna um, ask two questions, take, read two questions out, Joe, so we can perhaps move a little bit, a little bit more on this. Um, I would also encourage people to ask questions if they've experienced this process of policy in, in some of the global south uh, contexts where sometimes these things can be quite different. Uh, uh, it might be the case that they work better or not. Um, so that would be quite interesting as well. But let's, I'm just going to read these two ones out and perhaps Joe, you can address them. The first one is, is about media, actually. Um, so thanks for the talk. You mentioned the inclusion of the conversation in the partnership. Uh, do you think there have been lessons learned during COVID for how research and policy interact with the media for the purpose of using research findings to influence policy decisions? Um, and then the other one is, um, building on my question, I wonder what your thoughts are on how much scientists and researchers should tailor the way they conduct and present research to fit with the current priorities and values of the current decision makers. So that balance between uh, the, 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 well, your, your title, isn't it? The policy pull, which perhaps can take you to optimization and other emerging agendas, which as independent researchers, we want to, we want to develop and which we think are necessary is to, is to get that sort of balance. Great questions. You know, one of the problems with doing this stuff online is you can't have a conversation, really, uh, can you? Because I would love to, mm. to to hear from the people who are who are posing the questions and he hear their thoughts uh, that lie behind the the, the questions. Um, uh, it, you know, this kind of question and answer format is 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 perhaps less interesting than than uh, we could do if we were all in the same room. Um, Yes, I do. I, I think there are lots of lessons uh, to be learned about 
uh, how research and policy interact with with the media. Um, uh, I I think you know there 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 is no clear relationship uh, it, it, between what appears in the media and what ends up getting taken up in in policy. For, uh, for I mean, obviously there's you know there's not a there's not a clear uh, lesson learned there. I don't think um, if you make it into the media, you necessarily stand a better chance of 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 getting your uh, uh, work into decision making. Um, but the media is really important in terms of the way that things get framed and the way that that, that research agendas uh, take shape. They're a powerful player. Um, and, uh, and, and that's a very interesting uh, dynamic, um, which I'm sure people are, are, you know, are thinking hard about. Um, and, and of course, in all of that, uh, the levels of disinformation uh, and um, uh, and 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 misleading uh, research is is crucial. Uh, the reporting of on research in a way that is completely confusing and uh, uh, obfuscates uh, realities is 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 evident. Um, so I, I I I think there's an awful lot to your question. I don't have any simple um, you know uh, answers to, to to sorting out that that dynamic and and that mess when it's unhelpful but i think you raise a really important point um with respect to the one on um yeah current priorities i mean i think uh, you know uh, the the reality of this is um uh, if you are uh, hoping to uh, address uh, critical policy challenges uh, with research, you can't escape the need uh, to understand how those policy challenges are framed in current policy environments. So to that extent, I, I think um, there, there, uh, there, there are a set of challenges and a set of tensions uh, which we need to work with, because obviously uh, you, you you can't ignore the way that policy issues are framed. What you can do, I think, in, in the kind of evidence you provide and the dialogues around um, uh, uh, that, that, that framing and, and, and the way that you construct evidence agendas to address uh, framing, you, you, can, you, you can point out uh, other dimensions and other perspectives. Mm. Um, uh, now, of course, you know, that, that there's, uh, that, that, if you do that too much, you will uh, you will uh, uh, you run the risk of, of losing any policy interest in in what you're saying. Um, uh, but so I think you know if if that kind of tug of war uh, analogy that uh, that I mentioned earlier, that's the sort of that's one dimension of the tug of war that that um, you need to engage with. And and uh, but you need to be true to the evidence in 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 the way you you. Uh, you tr you try and reconcile those competing dimensions. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's a skill. Um, okay, shall we um, take another one? Um, I wonder whether Jo could say more about what role she thinks research funders could play in maximising the impact of research uh, stroke evidence on policy making. So there's been a shift towards impact. I think, which is, I think, good. Mm. That's true. Um, so, what, what, um, what, what's your view on on what funders can do to mm. improve both impact and maybe quality of evidence on, on policy making? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question, um, and uh, I think there's uh, th there's a lot that research funders can do and are doing uh, in this space. So, I mean, I think you know the the um, the support uh, for initiatives like IPO, which uh, prioritize synthesis of, of knowledge rather than the uh, the creation of, of new prime of new knowledge of on, on the prioritization of primary research, is actually um, part of of uh, of what research funders can and uh, and are doing that helps in this space. Um, 
because I uh, I think that challenge of trying to you know to integrate uh, and uh, and and make sense of of different uh, knowledge domains uh, with regard to policy is such an important one. Um, so maybe I would say that anyway, you know, because we we are uh, designed to to do that. Um, but I do think the willingness of of research funders not to prioritize kind of big bang breakthrough research and science all the time, but to concentrate uh, resources uh, also on, on knowledge synthesis and attempts to bring together knowledge uh, in ways that, that, that can really uh, um, are designed to, to facilitate evidence to policy interaction is, is an important one there. Yes, yes, that's a very good point. Now this question from Sarah Chater, I really like because it's exactly what I'm writing about now. So the question is this, um, thanks for a really interesting presentation, Joe. Thinking about the possibilities of increasing co-production between research and public policy, i.e. not just knowledge exchange, which, yeah, you know, which has this sort of static uh, ring uh, mm. about it, um, that is more about swapping ideas that is then working together to build new ideas so the policy maker perhaps becomes more active in the process mm. what are the potential implications and complications we need to think through for both academic independence and democracy are oh. um how do we navigate that so it, <laughs> maybe i don't know if you want to take this in parts or because there's, there's a lot in there but i think it's really important about policy governance there um you know new ways of thinking about policy so it's not just the top down state centrist but is also not just the market sort of led where the, the the policy just takes a back step it's about actively policy playing a role and how how knowledge is is developed it's yeah, yeah. no i'm i mean i you know in advocating all that i uh, i am advocating for, for, for bringing together these worlds of of policy for science uh science for policy science advice uh, and and uh, and 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 research um, and the supply of research, I and I do I think all of that is absolutely critical uh, and and I want to encourage it. Uh, I do think <laughs> we're running the risk of of of, of getting into territory where um, there's potential uh, for uh, for for really you know, important questions about the way in which we guarantee academic independence and, um, uh, and, and, uh, and, a, uh, and, a, and a democratic uh, approach. Um, because of course the risk is uh, when you link those uh, two domains in, in unhelpful ways is uh, science advice, uh, uh, agendas, um, the needs of of, uh, of what uh, government thinks is important in terms of research dominate. That's the that's the that's the bad scenario uh, where um, research agendas are totally defined by what policymakers uh, uh, think is is necessary. So I uh, I do see the danger there, um, uh, and. Uh, I, I think, you know, there's a certain um, a logic to the way uh, that research is uh, peer reviewed, is evaluated, that's constructed around uh, maintaining an integrity and an independence. And I think um, we need to think carefully about how we adapt that, uh, that quality assurance uh, role um, in in this new era, and and I do think those those sort of principles that I outlined earlier of, of kind of encouraging constant interrogation um, are, are important uh, in terms of of the quality of the research that's done uh, of uh, not letting uh, uh, the demand pull end uh, totally define research agendas and and the way that research is framed i think we need to think much more carefully mm. about, about the way we do that because because uh, i think you raise a really important point sarah that um 
that uh, that in the quest for impact and relevance in bringing together these worlds of the Republic of Science on the one hand and, and the needs of somewhere, the Republic of Somewheres on the other hand, uh, we, we, we are uh, endangering perhaps um, uh, uh, the institutions which we've used to guarantee integrity and, and high quality. Mm. I've um I've put in a little reference there, not um, or a couple of authors, Sarah, which you might find interesting for that question. The this paper by Law Law and Mole, um, or the work by them on um, techno specialities of policy, is um, they use actor network theory to look at and and how sometimes when you put together um, um, academics and policymakers, you create this you have to this fluid space. Uh, and that's really nice, I think, for thinking about new knowledge and, and how new knowledge can, can be co-produced. It's something that we've been mm. thinking about a lot. So that's mm. that's a really, I think, important question. Okay. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I think that, you know, that that, that element of, of co-production is is so important to the success in 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 being able to bridge the worlds of evidence and policy, being able to make uh, uh research relevant um i do think i do think it's 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 critical uh, and important but it raises um it raises some challenges uh as we go forward i mean i guess i i, I think um you know uh, a it brings in it brings into the conversation a need for um for actors to have uh, a degree of of kind of um you know, different sorts of capital, social capital, political capital, which enables them to withstand and and, uh, and withstand the tensions and and uh, play in the game as independent actors without getting compromised. Okay, so um, we're we're beginning to come to the end, but there are some interesting questions. Following on your uh, uh, metaphor of withstanding. Um, how can policy, uh, public policy researchers protect their mental health and physical security with all the online abuse and, um, what's this, doozing? Um, doxing, I'm not sure what that means, but maybe you have Chris Whitty in mind. Um, mm. uh, I, I don't know, is this, is this something, um, Joe, that, that you've, you've thought about? Is it is it something that maybe not you, but other people that you work with, people fear or come across when they expose themselves to views which may, you know, which which may may be unpopular? Um, it actually isn't something that that I've experienced or I have to say thought about a great deal. I mean, we we, I guess. Uh, there are the, the kind of people who are very much on the front line of this, people like Chris Whitty and Patrick Valance and a whole host of others uh, who are very public figures um, who have, uh, you know, uh, uh, roles in, in, in policy making which require them to, uh, to, to, to be in the public eye and, and, to, to, and, and they have taken a lot of abuse. Um, so I can actually, I can really see the issue you're raising that, um, you know, uh, Sticking to the sticking to the evidence, being true to to to, to what you know, does uh, open you up in and makes you vulnerable in all sorts of ways. But but you know, I guess because I, I work in a very kind of backroom uh, and and uh, way, and 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 we're not on uh, we're not so much in the public eye. It it, it hasn't affected me personally. That okay, so. Um... The final question we have, and we are just uh, almost at the end of the period here, is um, you uh, uh, mentioned the principle of humility um, when at the start of your talk and that, how that's necessary and how it affects uh, the relationship with with policymakers. Um, that's that's it's an interesting issue because we are privileged in a way, and people look up to us as academics uh, to to you know because they, they trust us perhaps more than other people. Um, uh, academics in general, I would say, in society. Um, so, um, how, how maybe you could talk a little bit more about how you see that um, 
the limits of our knowledge, et cetera, et cetera? What, what yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I think it is exactly with respect to that that I talked about, uh, that, that I was trying to make that point about humility, that we are, um, we are, 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 are working uh, to our, you know, best, to be our best possible selves and um, working in ways that, that uh, as, 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 as work, you know, integrators is trying to pull things together. Um, uh, we, we use all sorts of ways to, to try and guarantee that what we're doing is, is, is honest and of good quality and as reliable. But I think my point was that we do have to acknowledge, you know, like modelers, uh, I have to acknowledge that at some point every model is going to be wrong. Uh, we we have to acknowledge that at some point uh, we will have to acknowledge we will have to see what we've done as as incomplete, um, and therefore there's you know there, there's a certain humility. So <laughs> it's another tension, isn't it? Because on the one hand you have to you you, know, you have to honestly believe that what you're doing is is uh, is is worth it. And, and that a policymaker can can be confident uh, in in what you're saying and doing but I think part of that is acknowledged is, is acknowledging the limits of what you know as you put it Mateus I, I think that's important um, mm. and um, yeah um, um, it's an important principle to work from yes absolutely and it's a good principle um, so um, we are right up to the time now the the uh the we've 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 taken lots of different questions and uh joe thank you very much for sharing your experience it's it's you know it, it's a fascinating but tough job there um and there's a lot of questions which i i would i have for you maybe that we could discuss another time over a coffee that'd be lovely in Bloomsbury, which is one of my favorite neighborhoods um Welcome. I just want to say that uh, this whole um, uh, um, lecture and discussion uh, will be has been taped and will be you can you can you can download it or have a listen on the IDS website. Uh, I also want to say that um, to invite people to join us for the next Sussex Development Lecture, which will be on the 10th of March on reimagining development um, education in an uncertain world. With Professor Enke Schwite, um, Professor of Anthropology and Global Development and from the University of Sussex. And you can find the link to register on the IDS website. So um, thanks everyone. Um, once again, Joe, it's it's you know uh, it's great to get a space where you can just share and talk, and you've had lots of different questions from different sides uh, and from different areas. So your the way you've dealt with them and and how you deal with such a um, sensitive area, you know, is 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 really um, you know very very interesting for me certainly, and I'm sure for the others. So thank you very very much. Uh, thank you everyone for coming. We had a really good turnout, and uh, I I wish you all good night. Well, thank you to everyone. Uh, really grateful for the opportunity and some great questions. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye.